Hello everybody, Jonathan Zember here again for part two of my lecture on pediatric upper extremity trauma. Again, we're going to be focusing on x-rays. The objectives for this lecture are to go from the forearm down through the fingers. We're going to review nomenclature from part one of this lecture, and as well we want to familiarize ourselves with normal anatomy and variants, develop an approach to x-ray interpretation, and just in general, in general familiarize ourselves with common injuries. So again, when we are describing our fractures, we want to be able to describe them appropriately so we can convey what type of fracture it is to our other colleagues. So we have complete fractures, which are all the way through the bone, incomplete fractures. We have Salter Harris fractures, which involve the growth plate and pediatrics, and we have fractures that involve the joint. So again, just to review our Salter Harris classification in pediatric fractures that involve the growth plate. In type 1, it is just a fracture of the physis. In type 2, the fracture extends from the physis into the metaphysis. In type 3, it goes from the growth plate down into the epiphysis. And the type 4 involves both the metaphysis going through and through the growth plate into the epiphysis. Type 5 fracture is a little rarer, but those are crush injuries where you have loss of the growth plate altogether. Now, is a fracture angu angulated, translated, displaced? We always want to focus on the long axis of the bone, we call that the mid-diaphyseal line, and talk about how the fracture fragments relate relative to the long axis. So is it angulated or is it displaced or translated as shown in these diagrams? And of course you can have a combination of all of these type of injuries and fracture patterns including displacement with or without angulation and a combination of all of those as above. Okay, so we're going to go into the form. We'll talk about some normal variants at first. So in pediatrics, we have physiologic periosteal reaction, particularly in infants, um, but most specifically is going to be below six months. And they can be in multiple long bones, tibias, femur, humeri, as well, but I'm going to show you some examples of the form. And just to note that these should only be along the shaft. If it's if the periosteal reaction is centered around the metaphysis, that's going to be abnormal. So here we see physiologic periosteal reaction of the bilateral ulna, and you can see it's subtle, but it's there. And then another thing I wanted to discuss is what's known as this cupping and metaphyseal irregularity of the distal ulna. Now this is something that might be confused for rickets or for a fracture, um, but what we're seeing is these which the arrows point to in a two-month-old, this cupping and metaphyseal irregularity of the bilateral distal ulna. And again, we can see that on this, these images, these x-rays as well. You get these associated spurs, the arrows are pointing to of the distal ulna. And again, this is a normal, note the normal radial metaphyses, and we do not want to call this rickets. And so what are we looking at? These are this thin linear perichondrial bone spur. Um, it's at the periphery of the physis, and it represents the ring of the croix, which is the perichondrial bone spur. And why I'm bringing this up is we do not want to mistake this for our typical corner fractures, um, our classic metaphyseal lesions that we see in non-accidental trauma. So this diagram is showing the difference between the two of them. And of course, depending on the beam of the x-ray, if it's more oblique, the fracture resembles a bucket handle fracture. So leaving that, we're going to proceed to our other types of fractures. What is the most commonly missed fracture that we talk about in radiology? It's the second fracture, right? So our eye always jumps to the first fracture. We can see it easily, but we're going to miss that second fracture, and we do not want to. And I bring this up because we have the concept of fracture rings. So in the pelvis, in our mandible, in our tibia and fibula, as well as our radius and ulna, we always want to think about how the force gets transmitted through those bones 
and results in two fractures and if not a fracture then a dislocation so as an example what is the abnormality that we see over here right away our eye jumps to we see a proximal ulnar fracture but if we're not careful we're just going to miss the other finding on this which is radial head dislocation now what type of fracture is this called this is known as a montagia we have two classic fracture dislocations of the forearm one is called a montagia which is the, where the ulnar gets fractured and the other is galeazzi where the radius gets fractured there's a mnemonic to remember these mugger but it's not important to remember the actual eponyms but what is more important is to recognize both injuries so these are examples of a galeazzi fracture where we're seeing the distal radial shaft fracture and if we're not too if we're not too thorough in our inspection we're going to miss this distal radial ulnar joint dislocation and that's important because if this patient just gets casted without their both fra both the fracture and the dislocation reduced then when they follow up in two weeks afterwards to see how they're healing at that point it's too late and they're going to need to have operative reduction so we do want to make sure that we catch all these fractures early in time our we have in pediatrics are what we call galeazzi equivalent because you have an epiphysis that's involved as well so while something might appear to be well located the distal radial ulnar joint may appear to be well located it's actually there is a dislocation here um, because of the epiphysis has come off of the metaphysis known as epiphysiolysis. Okay, in the forearm, we also have plastic or bowing fractures, which can often be subtle. I like to look at these best on the lateral view and see this kind of increased curvature or bowing. And then in terms of the distal radius, we're going to have a lot of different nomenclature for different types of fractures and they can have as you can see various classifications coley's fractures are the ones that we see most often and I'm not going to go through examples of all of them but i do want to highlight what we call the pronator fat pad sign and we can see examples on the left of normal and on the right of abnormal and when you have a fracture the fluid or the hematoma that's coming out of the bone kind of trickles down along that forearm and expands that pronator fat pad. Okay, what do we see as our abnormality over here? Um, our eye gets drawn to right away, this distal radial Salter-Harris II fracture. Now, all I wanted to highlight over here is that you can often have significant displacement, which goes under noticed. Um, in, in this example, we might consider there not to be significant displacement um, if this happened in the shaft, but when it's the epiphysis relative to the metaphysis, we want to make sure that there isn't significant displacement as there is over here, um, because those have different types of healing than just the shafts themselves. If this type of displacement was in the, in the radial shaft or the ulnar shaft, we would not have as high a threshold in terms of our reduction. Another common entity that we see is what we call gymnast wrists. See this in adolescents, and this is a physial widening and irregularity that we can see better on MRI. Moving on to the wrist, we have a bunch of carpal bones that articulate with each other as well as with the metacarpals and when I approach my wrist evaluation because there are so many bones what I like to do is look at the rows there are the proximal rows of proximal row of carpals and then there's a distal row and we want to make sure as these arrows are pointing to that there are arcs between them and that those arcs are smooth and we're going to use those arcs to figure out if something is disrupted if there is a fracture or a dislocation of our common fractures of the metacarp of the carpal bones that we do not want to miss are scaphoid bone fractures um, these are particularly at risk 
for avascular necrosis because of their vascular supply. And when there's avascular necrosis, we'll get non-union, as we can see in this image over here. Now looking at those carpal rows, here is an example of scaphalunate ligament injury, where on the left hand we have widening of that scaphalunate interval relative to, relative to what it's supposed to look like on the right. This is another example of disruption of the arcs of the carpal rows, and here we can actually see that there's a lunate dislocation. Um, and you have disruption that we see on the frontal view, but as well as on the lateral view as well. Moving on to the hand, we have a bunch of fractures that we're going to encounter fairly commonly. This is the boxer's fracture that is pretty common in trauma in both children and adults. And then we have a, a bunch of different types of finger fractures that we should be familiar with. And I'll show you some examples of those. Here we have our injury to the extensor tendon, and we get a fracture from that impact. You can see this fracture. Here's another example, maybe a little more subtle, where we're getting volar plate avulsion. And then when we're looking at our fingers, can we spot the abnormality over here? Might be a little difficult. We get an oblique view. Again, it's a little difficult very subtle, but if we're looking closely, we can see that there's disruption of the cortex of the proximal phalanges of both the third and fourth proximal phalanges, and we can see that that extends to the physis, so that's going to be consistent with a Salter-Harris II fracture. So in summary, we've gone through the terminology of fractures, we've gone through the normal anatomy, We've developed an approach to x-ray interpretation from the forearm down to the fingers, and we've gone through a bunch of common injuries that we will encounter. And with that, I thank you very much, and I hope that you enjoyed this lecture.